bank accounts. Um, and then it comes to this point of identity. Because I think many of us, myself included, there's a danger of being identified or finding your identity in what you do for a living. Like, that's who I am, man. And, and that's giving yourself over to money, in a way. You're just doing and you're being that person. And that's great if God has made you a doctor. There's people that they're just, that's the way they are, and they're great doctors because God uses their personality. But don't, and especially for young people, do not find your identity and, and <laughs> become, you know, whatever it might be. Because the, the first and foremost thing that we should identify with, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer me that lives. It's no longer me that makes the money. It's no longer me in my career. It's Christ in me. The hope of glory. It's Christ in me. For the, uh, gosh, I used to have that, you know, Galatians 2.20. I had that whole thing memorized. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I but Jesus lives within me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And how dare we say, no, I, I only identify with you on Sunday morning from this time to this time. No, it's at your workplace. It's who you are. He wants to use you wherever you are. Don't, don't have your identity wrapped up in what you do to make money. That's, that's uh, worldly, again. And many people just completely lose themselves. They, they completely, uh, they never fully, God can never fully use who they are because, well, it's given over to their workplace. Um, and how empty, right? Just riches, again, it's vanishing away. Um, Another scripture, just a few pages over to Hebrews 13, 9, with this whole idea of establishing your hearts for the coming of the Lord. In Hebrews 13, 9, we're reminded how to establish our hearts. Do not be carried away by strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that our hearts be established with what? Grace. There you go again with grace. I thought you were talking about works. How do you establish your heart? It's by grace. It's not by <laughs> pulling up your bootstraps and getting to work. You establish your hearts by grace. And, and it, it's always coming back to that. We, when, we, when we start thinking, yeah, I can do that, I can do this, and, and we start thinking, this is how this happens, we... Too often we can forget that it's by grace that our hearts are strengthened. That's establish is an interesting word. We get our English word steroids from that word establish in verse 8. And it just means to make firm, to strengthen. And then of course verse 9 always con uh, <laughs> convicts, doesn't it? Grudge not against one another. <laughs> you know, don't be griping and complaining Behold, the judge stands at the door. He's, he's right there. There's one thing that's, that's a certainty. It's kind of a trick question. <laughs> what is it that is totally certain? 100%. Death and taxes. <laughs> Death and taxes. It's a good guess. It's neither. Because we shall not all sleep. We will not all die. Death is not the certain thing. What's certain is, the end of verse 9, the judgment. The judge stands at the door. That is the one certainty, other than taxes. That's a good one. <laughs> but the one certainty is we will all stand before the judgment. We will all come. And you know what? There ain't going to be no one to blame. It's going to be you and God. 
not going to be the way it was with, with Adam and Eve, right? He, she did it. The, oh, the serpent. They were pointing fingers here and there. No. It's between you and him. No one to blame. There's not going to be anyone that you can point to. It's, it's between you and God. That's why it's so important not to have a relationship with God through your wife, not to have a relationship with God through your children, not to have a relationship with God through your church, through a pastor. It's you. Because when it comes down to it, when you stand before the righteous, holy, almighty judge, that's what it boils down to. So what do I do when trouble comes? What do you do when trouble hits? Well, we call all two of our friends and complain and ask for help. Or we go on Facebook and start a GoFundMe thing. Now, this will get me out of it. What does it tell us to do? Is any afflicted among you? Verse 13. I know we kind of jumped down there, but you saw how fast I was going. Wouldn't make it if I didn't. Is any afflicted? That's, is, is anyone troubled? Is anyone suffering? Don't tell people about it. Don't complain. Don't call on humans. What does it tell you? Let him pray. Underline that. Circle that. Because that is the most powerful thing you could do. And the enemy has convinced many people, nah, it doesn't do much. It's cute when you're a kid or something. But no, prayer is powerful. And it's so important that it's the first thing we do, not the last thing we do. Too often, well, I've done everything I can. I've I've sent the letter in, I've done this, I guess we should pray. No. <laughs> Have you prayed before you tried any of those things in the flesh, right? Because God works. <laughs> Amen? Amen? God works. Amen. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then you find yourself happy? Hey, sing songs about it. Sing psalms. Verse 13. Uh, Someone said scripture songs because the word there at the end of verse 13, psalms, refers to the scriptures, refers to the psalms of David that we're getting right smack dab in the middle of your Bible. And how, how awesome it is to sing songs of scripture. For one thing, it gets you to memorize scripture, but also you know what you're singing is right. <laughs> it's not written by some, you know, uh, I don't know. So, human. Uh, is any sick among you? Now, this is really misunderstood. Uh, many have abused, and that's why I wanted to get to this, this whole idea of healing. Um, is any sick among you? Let the sick person call for the elders. Um, you know, don't ever let the one who's sick lay a guilt trip on dad or myself and say, what happened? I will, I've been sick for two weeks. No, none of you cared to call and see how it was doing? Listen, it's you, the sick person, The it's your responsibility to call upon the elders. Why? Because for one thing, you humble yourself in doing that. You show humility. But for another thing, you also show your need. <laughs> you, you know that you need it. You're not trusting in the doctors. You're not trusting in the medicine. But you're, you're saying by calling on the elders that yeah, I trust in the Lord before anything. Before any of it. Now God can use doctors. God can use medicine. But where should your trust be? Where is your faith? When it's you that calls for the elders, also note, because there's a lot in here that it's overlooked. Elders, you might just circle the S at the end of elders. It is not calling for one guy. It's, it's elders plural for a reason. Because if God chooses to touch and heal that person, and it's just my dad at the place, guess who's taking the credit, man? <laughs> Start a ministry. Gary Weatherly can heal you for a low price of 59 dollars 
And that's why. Uh, God's so good. He has this stuff in here for a reason. It should be more than one so that they know it's God who did it. They, neither one of them can take the credit for it. And let them pray over Him, anointing Him with oil. Now, the interesting thing about the oil is there, are, there was and there still is healing aspects, healing things in oils. In, uh, whether it was oils of that day and oils that's used in ointment and things like that. And, and those things can heal. It can help with the healing. But we don't anoint with oil trusting in that oil. My wife is big into essential oils. You guys know that. And I have to remind her, it's not the oil. God can use that, and that stuff does help. God created the plants that those oils come from, right? But hey, God may just heal someone without any of that. And the other thing to, to make note of with the oil in Scripture, oil always represents the Holy Spirit. So have the Spirit... All over that prayer. <laughs> have it be in the Spirit. Have it be Spirit-led. Nothing of ourselves. So there's kind of a two-sided meaning to those anointing with oil. But I think the, mo the, the most powerful, of course, is the Spirit. Um, and that, when it's Spirit-led, it will always cause you to pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, that phrase, in the name, it, it carries an idea. It carries this meaning with it, by the will. You know, it's, it's not, we just say, and we, we say it too casually, too, it just in passing, in Jesus' name. And that, that has a heavy, heavy meaning. When you truly want your prayer to be, I want Jesus' name to be right up, He would stand for this. Think of that when you next time you do that, you know. Lord bless this Burger King in Jesus' name. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but and God can do it, right? God's amazing. Um, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he commits sins, they shall be forgiven. Uh, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man of the other month. Now, verse 15 and 16, James 5, 15 and 16 should always be pray, read in context together like that. Why? Because we're not talking about physical healing. And many times in Jesus' ministry, there was someone who was physically Ailed. They were physically hurting. They had an infirmity. And it was a result of sin. It not, it's not always the case, but in many times, Jesus, when the paralytic was, was lowered down into the room, the first thing He said to him was, your sins are forgiven you. And the friends who lowered Him went through all that work to lower I'm sure said, well, that's not why we brought Him to you. <laughs> But it was. That's what the man needed. And that's what many need. God's just using the cancer. God's just using the, the uh, broken leg, the, bro the, the liver that's giving out to get that person to the hospital, to get them to the point where your sins are forgiven. So it's, it's awesome how James here sees that. He, he understands. Really, the important thing to do here is verse 16, confess your faults one to another. Your sins will be forgiven you. Now don't misunderstand. It's not, because another instant happened, I think it's John chapter 9, yeah, John chapter 9, where the blind man who was blind from birth came, and Jesus and his disciples asked Jesus, which person sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus said, you idiots. No, he didn't say <laughs> But it's never, you know, the, the sin is not, there's cases where a person is just blind. A person is just 
got one leg. A person just has one eye working. Whatever it is, it's not due to some sin in his life. Read the book of Job. So watch out for that mentality, because that so often can come. Another thing about healing, and this will be the last thing I bring up about that, um, comes from 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, I promise we're, we're descending the flight. It's coming down here. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. And God has set some in the church, in our midst, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then the gifts, plural, again, of healings, plural. Why is that so important? Because of the movement that's still going on, and they believe that this person...